right? So let's read all three of them. Sa, Gai. Complementary schools are uh, voluntary schools. They're outside of the state sector. They're often hidden from view. Um, many people don't know about them, including teachers in the mainstream. They're schools that young people go to mainly to learn the language that's associated with their uh, heritage group. Go, ga, you, guy. Broadly speaking, there are three aims for complement schools. One is social, to, to have a, a, a place where people can meet together. And educational, uh, in the sense that there's some sort of formal or semi-formal education. And the third one is a religious or cultural aim. Something that was perhaps unique about this research is that we worked in a large multilingual team of researchers across eight schools in four cities. We went to two Gujarati schools in Leicester, two Bengali schools in Birmingham, two Chinese schools, one Cantonese and one Mandarin in Manchester, and two Turkish schools in London. We are a multilingual nation. Um, we've been for a long time and we're going to continue to be. It's important, we feel, to study multilingualism and our multilingual young people. We basically stayed in the schools as long as we could. We hung around uh, and tried to capture everything that we could while we were there, uh, and that included uh, detailed observation, ethnographic observation, in-depth interviewing uh, with our key participants, our stakeholders in the research, and also recording the young people. After we'd been in the schools for several weeks, we identified one student from, or two students from, from each class, and asked them to wear uh, a digital audio voice recorder uh, so that we could really listen in on the language and languages that these young people were using. I think one thing that all eight schools shared was an enthusiasm for the whole project of complementary schools. And so for me, it was a real honor to, um, to go into each school and see the energy of the teachers and the community and really the commitment of the students being there on basically their day off from mainstream school, you know, to be there for, for learning. We have a, a shot of an assembly where the head teacher is talking to the young people, to the parents and to the teachers and everybody's there and everybody has different levels of proficiency and she moves between her languages seamlessly in order to engage and pull in the people in that audience. And so that was a major finding of our project that, um, that the complementary schools were doing very innovative things with language and that in terms of pedagogy I would suggest that the mainstream has something to learn from complementary schools. This research isn't just about the present or the past, it's really about the future. What we've been able to do is to go inside them and say here are all kinds of um, positive practices which are going on in complementary schools about creating multilingual spaces, about using language flexibly, uh, about using the full range of young people's linguistic repertoires. It offers an opportunity to study aspects of, um, of history and culture and folklore that isn't necessarily um, included in the mainstream and on the mainstream curriculum. From my personal point of view, I think the research has been very good for myself for taking part in research because it's a reflexive exercise and I can see now uh, what my work is contributing, which, you, which I was unaware of until I did the research. We, we think that in raising the profile of complementary schools, in raising the profile of multilingualism, and, in, in, and by saying that multilingualism is not and is never uh, a problematic issue unless you make it so, then we're able to, to contribute to policymakers' understanding of the way that people really are using language in multilingual Britain.